228, Chapter 6 of Dracula. Welcome to Craftlet. The podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from the shores of the Potomac in Virginia, the Old Dominion. Episode 228, The Smell of the Pea Soup, The Roar of the Vacuum. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by Knit Circus, the online magazine featuring three rings of knitting, sewing, and fun. You can find out more by visiting www.knitcircus.com. Also, Tea Times Creations. You can find vintage China tea stands, fittings, and more. Visit Tea Times Creations at Etsy.com or follow the link in the show notes. And Cool for Cats, the new novel by Andrew C. Ordover. You can get it at Amazon.com or find out more from the link in the show notes. And this episode and next month's episodes are all brought to you by you. Thank you so much, you incredibly generous, wonderful people. I'm, um, I'm overwhelmed. I am eternally grateful. And now I don't have to worry about the podcast for the rest of the year. Thank you. And thank you for your notes. And thank you. Just thank you. I, you know, I'm not lying. You people are just better than everybody else. It's just a fact that you're going to have to live with. So thank you. If I say too much more, I'm going to get choked up, and that will be a problem, because then I'll sound all funny for the rest of the podcast. The podcast, The Smell of the Pea Soup, The Roar of the Vacuum, uh, my mother is arriving later today for a little bit of a visit, which means there is much cleaning to be done and dinner to be made, and of course, this is the one day of the week that I have to take the kids to things, so it's a little crazy. As a consequence, I am not going to talk to you much about anything crafty, except to tell you that I got invited to a local stitch and bitch and finally made it because Nanette the Nanny on Ravelry came and kidnapped me (laughs) and forced me to go. And I had the best time. The Dulles area stitch and bitch, lovely people, had the best time, knit, knit, knit. And Nanette the Nanny and I are working on a rather intricate piece of color work. It's a pattern. I haven't decided if I'm going to try and put it up on Nitty and see if it'll get accepted or if I'm just going to put it for sale. But I'm very excited about it and it is the thing that I'm working on right now. So a little preview for you. And all I can tell you is it's unique construction and it is serious color work. And the, uh, the only little newsy bits I have for you is uh, Jenny wrote me back mid-month, and I completely dropped the ball on this. Uh, people in Philadelphia, did you know that there has been a month-long Dracula festival at the Rosenbach Museum near Rittenhouse Square? Uh, I'm so sorry I didn't announce this before, but there's all sorts of really cool books that are in the collection at that museum. Maurice Sendak's papers are part of the collection. Um, every other first edition a girl could dream of, Don Quixote, anyone? As well as things like the manuscript for Ulysses and letters by George Washington, along with furniture, silver paintings, etc. I wish I could go, but uh, that's www.rosenbach.org, spelled the way you think it would be spelled, R-O-S-E-N-B-A-C-H. So, I am so sorry I didn't get that out to you earlier. The other little announcement I wanted to let you know about, Marla F. on Ravelry emailed that BJ Harrison of the Classic Tales podcast, who I've mentioned before, I know a lot of you listen to him, he just did The Judge's House by Bram Stoker. That is the story that scared the bejujus out of me. So, I'm just saying, it's creepy. And you know, I've been reading a lot about Bram Stoker, kind of, you know, our zeitgeist thing that we do. And some people have called him a hack, and some people have said, you know, that Dracula was the only thing worth anything that he wrote. And he was a really busy guy. I mean, 
the man he worked for in the theater was, oh, how do you say it nicely? Um, he was uh, one of the reasons that actor divas have been stereotyped the way that they've been stereotyped. How's that? Um, he was kind of demanding. And Bram Stoker did all the work. And Henry Irving got all the praise. And I, I mean, how Bram Stoker managed to write this sucker at all amazes me. The fact that it took him seven years to do it doesn't surprise me. Looking at how long it's been taking me to edit a novel that I finished writing years ago. But the editing process, the, the, the moving all the pieces back into uh, positions that make more sense or uh, upping the ante, raising the stakes and, and making sure that the climax is actually a climax instead of just stuff that happens. All of that is hard work. And, and Stoker did such an awesome job. So anyway, I I think his short stories are scary, and I thought The Judge's House was right up there with Edgar Allan Poe. And what with it being almost Halloween when you listen, I have a little bit of an Edgar Allan Poe treat for you. You will remember John. John, our wonderful John, who read, read Jonathan Harker for us, who we will not be visiting again for a little while because suspense must be built up and all of that. John missed you. And so John has recorded The Raven for us. And I'm going to play that for you today before we listen to chapter six <laughs> of Dracula. Um, just a couple of things to know about The Raven. Um, it did make Edgar Allan Poe famous. It did not, however, make him rich. And, you know, some of the better writers of the day went, you know, Puh. Uh, Emerson didn't like it. Yeats didn't like it. Uh, they, they just thought it was kind of um, rhythmic trickery, you know, not, not a real poem. However, in his defense, Elizabeth Barrett evidently wrote to him. Now, he, has, he had reviewed some of her poetry, and so I, I think there was probably a correspondence already between them, but she wrote to him uh, and said, Your raven has produced a sensation, a fit to horror here in England. Some of my friends are taken by the fear of it and some by the music. I hear of persons haunted by nevermore. Which is just awesome. What a great thing to hear about your poem. Oh, so if you've never listened to the, po the poem before, and if that is you, have you been living under a rock? Or did you just have some English teacher who had no sense of fun at Halloween? I can't think of anybody who has not heard it at least once in their lifetime or read it at least once in their lifetime. But it is a narrative poem. It tells the story of a, a young man, uh, presumably a scholar, who is regretting a lost love and wrestling with the I want to forget versus the I don't want to forget, which is understandable. Uh, it's set in December, a very dark month. And for anyone who has ever seen a raven in real life, we saw them at the Tower uh, last year on the London Bath and Wales trip. They are big birds. They are really, really big birds. And if one was near you, and then spoke, you would jump out of your shorts. You just would. They're, they're huge. I mean, they're, you know, they're not a condor, but they're big birds. They're bigger than a crow. Now, this was written considerably before Dracula was. Uh, January 1845 was its publication date. So, you know, this is a long, this is 50 years before Stoker wrote Dracula, so, you know, it's not like you're going to hear any great resonance between the two texts, but it just seemed like the right time of year to play this for you. So here we have John reading for us, The Raven. The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe, read by John Scholes. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. 
While I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this, and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember, it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow from my books a cease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore. For the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels named Lenore, nameless here for evermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. So that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, "'some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. "'This it is, and nothing more. "'Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. "'Sir,' said I, "'or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore.' But the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that scarce was sure I heard you, here I opened wide the door, darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming, dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the darkness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when with many a flirt and flutter in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore, Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven, wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Much I marvelled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door. Bird or beast above the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such name as Nevermore. But the raven sitting lonely on the placid bust spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing further than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, Nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, Doubtless said I what it utters is its only stock and store, Caught from some unhappy master whom unmerciful disaster Followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore. 
Till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore Of never, never more. But the raven still beguiling all my sad soul into smiling, Straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking I betook myself to linking fancy unto fancy, Thinking, what this ominous bird of yore, What this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt and ominous bird of yore Meant in croaking nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining, on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er, but whose violet velvet lining with the lamplight gloating over, she shall press, ah, nevermore. Then, methought, the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God has lent thee, by these angels he has sent thee, respite, respite, and nepent thee from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff this kind nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore, quoth the raven. Nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore. Is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet said, I think of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore. Tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels named Lenore. Clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels named Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked up starting, Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken, quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight over him streaming throws his shadow on the floor, and my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. The End John Scholes is a freelance actor, writer, director, and has an ego that can only be crushed by the falling of planets. To offer him work, or to compliment him on his snazzy new outfits, feel free to contact him via his website at www.vagnet.com. Thank you. So there, you get your Jonathan Harker voice fix, but not Jonathan Harker today. Today we stay with the women, briefly, and Dr. Seward. So we have Elizabeth Klett, who is reading Mina, and we have Aaron Ziegler, who is again reading John Seward. I, I think I started to say last week how important a character Dr. Seward is, and today you'll start to see why, and you'll also start to see why I am so grateful to Aaron Ziegler for reading the part for us. It is tricky and complicated. Seward is, I think, the most complicated character in the book. For example, he is a wonderful character who I would like to go have a beer with, 
but I would not like him treating anyone in my family. <laughs> does that make me a hypocrite? I suppose it does. It's, uh, he's, he's a tricky guy to like. He too, I think, is cast quite well in the uh, Coppola Dracula. Actually, you know, the cast, aside from Keanu, who is kind of a block of wood, the cast in that movie is really quite good. It was, it's just so overwrought, you know? But at least the characters are named correctly. You can hear me. I'm probably going to rage about that Frank Langella version for the rest of my life. Anyway, Seward was played by Richard E. Grant. If you saw the movie How to Get Ahead in Advertising, you saw uh, Richard Grant or um, With Nail and I, which he is very, very famous for, which I think was his first movie. He's really quite marvelous. It's a very odd film if you haven't seen it before. But Richard Grant, Grant, I think, has kind of the right mournful quality to him for Dr. Seward. You know, Lucy said no to him. He's basically alone in a madhouse, and he's a man of science. And so, you know, love and those kinds of emotions have to be quite difficult for him, uh, since he is really looking for kind of a logical answer two things. So he throws himself into his work. And that is what you get to hear about today. And you will be introduced really to a, such a wonderful character. You've already heard about him, but you'll hear more. And because we have the superior Mr. Ziegler reading for us, you really get a sense of voice for Renfield. This will continue to be important because Seward's diary starts to take over huge swaths of the narrative. So, uh, <laughs> join me in being thankful for the presence of Aaron Ziegler in our lives. Now, the, the other thing about this chapter today, I, I remember reading somewhere, uh, it was a few years ago, that all of the best books, m m fiction books, modern especially fiction books, but even, you know, older ones, the best books are like travel guides. They take you places where you've never been before or places that you want to go back to or, you know, bring up some kind of nostalgia or something, but they, they give you a real sense of place. And we've already seen Bram Stoker do that with a place that he'd never been, which was all of the, the Transylvania, the Eastern European stuff. But you're going to hear him do it today with a place that he did spend time. And in fact, this is the place where he was in a library looking at books and found the name Dracula written in a book. He's going to Whitby. Now, Whitby is gorgeous. Allow me, allow me to say, wow, I want to go. Now, to locate Whitby for you, it's in uh, North Yorkshire on the eastern coast, so the continental side of England. It's about parallel with Belfast, Ireland, or the Isle of Man, the top edge of the Isle of Man. So, you know, it's, it's up there. It's uh, south of Carlisle, but uh, north of Manchester and Sheffield. And it is on the water, and it's lovely. It's quite a distance from London, but of course, there were trains. Now, Whitby is famous for a couple of reasons. A, it's gorgeous. B, it has an abbey, uh, one of the ones that got uh, torn down by Henry VIII, so it's ruins, but it's quite lovely, and in fact, bears striking resemblance to Tintern Abbey, where we went last year. It was lovely. And there are some really cool old places hanging around. There's also a really lovely seaside town and you get that described to you and just like the cob at lyme regis whitby has a, a seawall that's built out from it which is kind of cool and it's um really lovely and kind of quaint it also has uh, a sea bench that is opposite the inlet from the abbey so that you could sit on a bench and look across and see the the boatyard and um, and also the abbey. Now we have been graced with lots of people who have been to Whitby and uh, and lots of pictures which are online and available for you to see. I will make sure that there are some on the website for you to look at. Uh, it's 
really, really beautiful. But as you can imagine, kind of an interesting place because it's northerly. It's on the channel side. It's between, well, it's, it goes across the, the North Sea. Um, it's parallel to the bottom of Denmark. I mean, it's way up there. And the sea there is a bit on the rough side. Just saying. So, interesting place. Obviously, shipping lane. And hmm, I don't want to give anything else away. But I will tell you this. There is a character, an old coot, who you will meet today. He is <laughs> a little hard to understand, not because the reader is bad. She does a marvelous job with him. But just because he is speaking like a Yorkshireman, and therefore, for those of us who are not from Yorkshire, it's a little tricky to understand him. You may wish to rewind and listen I kind of doubt that you're going to need to listen twice to him because the context is pretty clear and Mina does a very good job of kind of expanding on him. The really nifty part about that character is that he's based on a real guy who Stoker met when he was in Whitby. So that's kind of cool. All right then, I'm going to launch you into your chapter today, chapter six of Dracula. You thought I was going to forget, didn't you? Mina Murray's Journal. 24th July, Whitby. Lucy met me at the station, looking sweeter and lovelier than ever, and we drove up to the house at the Crescent in which they have rooms. This is a lovely place. The little river, the Esk, runs through a deep valley, which broadens out as it comes near the harbour. A great viaduct runs across, with high piers, through which the view seems somehow further away than it really is. The valley is beautifully green, and it is so steep that when you are on the high land on either side, you look right across it, unless you are near enough to see down. The houses of the old town, the side away from us, are all red-roofed, and seem piled up one over the other anyhow, like the pictures we see of Nuremberg. Right over the town is the ruin of Whitby Abbey, which was sacked by the Danes, and which is the scene of part of Marmion, where the girl was built up in the wall. It is a most noble ruin, of immense size, and full of beautiful and romantic bits. There is a legend that a white lady is seen in one of the windows. Between it and the town there is another church, the parish one, round which is a big graveyard, all full of tombstones. This, to my mind, is the nicest spot in Whitby, for it lies right over the town, and has a full view of the harbour, and all up the bay to where the headland called Kettleness stretches out into the sea. It descends so steeply over the harbour that part of the bank has fallen away, and some of the graves have been destroyed. In one place part of the stonework of the graves stretches out over the sandy pathway far below. There are walks with seats beside them, through the churchyard, and people go and sit there all day long looking at the beautiful view and enjoying the breeze. I shall come and sit here often myself and work. Indeed, I am writing now with my book on my knee, and listening to the talk of three old men who are sitting beside me. They seem to do nothing all day but sit here and talk. The harbour lies below me, with, on the far side, one long granite wall stretching out into the sea, with a curve outwards at the end of it, in the middle of which is a lighthouse. A heavy sea-wall runs along outside of it. On the near side, the sea-wall makes an elbow crooked inversely, and its end, too, has a lighthouse. Between the two piers there is a narrow opening into the harbour, which then suddenly widens. It is nice at high water, but when the tide is out it shoals away to nothing, and there is merely the stream of the Esk, running between banks of sand, with rocks here and there. Outside the harbour on this side there rises for about half a mile a great reef, the sharp of which runs straight out from behind the south lighthouse. At the end of it is a buoy, with a bell, which swings in bad weather, and sends in a mournful sound on the wind. They have a legend here, that when a ship is lost, bells are heard out at sea. I must ask the old man about this. He is coming this way. He is a funny old man— 
He must be awfully old, for his face is gnarled and twisted like the bark of a tree. He tells me that he is nearly a hundred, and that he was a sailor in the Greenland fishing fleet when Waterloo was fought. He is, I am afraid, a very sceptical person, for when I asked him about the bells at sea and the white lady at the abbey, he said, very brusquely, "'I wouldn't fash myself about them, miss. Them things be all wore out. Mind, I don't say they never was, but I do say that they wasn't in my time. They be all very well for commers and trippers and the like, but not for a nice young lady like you.' "'Them feet folks from York and Leeds that be always eatin' cured herons and drinkin' tea and lookin' out to buy cheap jet would creed out. I wonder, Marcel, who'd be botherin' tellin' lies to them, even the newspapers, which is full of fool talk.' I thought he would be a good person to learn interesting things from, so I asked him if he would mind telling me something about the whale-fishing in the old days. He was just settling himself to begin, when the clock struck six, whereupon he laboured to get up and said— "'I must gang again words home now, miss. My granddaughter doesn't like to be kept waiting when the tea is ready, for it takes me time to crammle aboon the grease, for there be a many of em, and, miss, I lack belly-timber sairly by the clock.' He hobbled away, and I could see him hurrying as well as he could down the steps. The steps are a great feature on the place. They lead from the town to the church. There are hundreds of them. I do not know how many, and they wind up in a delicate curve— the slope is so gentle that a horse could easily walk up and down them. I think they must originally have had something to do with the abbey. I shall go home, too. Lucy went out, visiting with her mother, and as they were only duty calls, I did not go. 1st August. I came up here an hour ago with Lucy, and we had a most interesting talk with my old friend and the two others who always come and join him. He is evidently the Sir Oracle of them— and I should think must have been in his time a most dictatorial person. He will not admit anything, and down faces everybody. If he can't out-argue them, he bullies them, and then takes his silence for agreement with his views. Lucy was looking sweetly pretty in her white lawn frock. She has got a beautiful colour since she has been here. I noticed that the old men did not lose any time in coming and sitting near her when we sat down. She is so sweet with old people— I think they all fell in love with her on the spot. Even my old man succumbed and did not contradict her, but gave me double share instead. I got him on the subject of the legends, and he went off at once into a sort of sermon. I must try to remember it, and put it all down. "'It be all fool talk. Lock, stock, and barrel. That's what it be, and no else. These bands and wafts and bogusts and barguests and bogles and all anent them is only fit to set bairns and dizzy women a belderin. They be nought but airblebs. They and all grims and signs and warrens be all invented by persons and illsome burke bodies and railway touters to skeer and scunner halflings and to get folks to do something that they don't other incline to. It makes me ireful to think of them. Why, it's them that not content with printin' lies and paper and preachin' them out of pulpits, does want to be cuttin' them on the tombstones. Look here, all round you, and whate'er you wilt. All them steens, holdin' up their heads as well as they can out of their pride, is a cant, simply tumblin' down with the weight of the lies wrote on them. Here lies the body, or sacred to the memory, wrote on all of them. And yet in nigh half of them there bain't no bodies at all— and the memories of them bain't care to pinch a snuff about, much less sacred. Lies, all of them, nothing but lies of one kind or another. My gog, but it'll be a queer scroderment at the day of judgment, when they come tumbling up in their death sarks, all duped together and trying to drag their tomb steams with them to prove how good they was, some of them trimlin' and ditherin' with their hands that dozened and slippery from lying in the sea, that they can't even keep their girp of them. I could see from the old fellow's self-satisfied air, and the way in which he looked round for the approval of his cronies, that he was showing off. So I put in a word to keep him going. "'Oh, Mr. Swales, you can't be serious. Surely these tombstones are not all wrong.' "'Yablins! There may be a poorish few not wrong, savin' where they make out the people too good, for there be folk that do think a balm-bowl be like the sea, if only it be their own.' The whole thing be only lies. Now look you here. You come here a stranger, and you see this Kirkgarth. I nodded, for I thought it better to assent, though I did not quite understand his dialect. 
I knew it had something to do with the church. He went on, And you con say that all these steens be aboon folk that happed be here, snod and snog? I assented again. Then that be just where the lie comes in. Why, there be scores of these lay bed that be tomb as old Dunn's back a box on Friday night. He nudged one of his companions, and they all laughed. And my gog! How could they be otherwise? Look at that one, the after sabaft the beer bank, read it! I went over and read, Edward Spencelag, Master Mariner, murdered by pirates off the coast of Andres, April, 1854, age thirty. When I came back, Mr. Swales went on. Who brought him home, I wonder, to hap him here? Murdered off the coast of Andres! And you consated his body lay under. Why, I could name ye a dozen whose bones lie in the Greenland seas above, he pointed northwards, or where the currents may have drifted them. There be the steens round ye. Ye can, with your young eyes, read the small print of the lies from here. This Braithwaite Lowry, I knew his father, lost in the lively off Greenland in twenty. Or Andrew Woodhouse, drowned in the same seas in 1777. Or John Paxton, drowned off Cape Farewell a year later. Or old John Rawlings, whose grandfather sailed with me, drowned in the Gulf of Finland in fifty. Do you think that all these men will have to make a rush to Whitby when the trumpet sounds? I have me anthems about it. I tell you that when they got here they'd be jommelin' and jostlin' one another in the way that it'd be out like a fight on the ice in the old days, when we'd be at one another from daylight to dark, and tryin' to tie up our cuts by the aurora borealis. This was evidently local pleasantry, for the old man cackled over it, and his cronies joined in with gusto. But, said I, Surely you are not quite correct, for you start on the assumption that all the poor people, or their spirits, will have to take their tombstones with them on the Day of Judgment. Do you think that will really be necessary? Well, what else be they tombstones for? Answer me that, miss. To please their relatives, I suppose. To please their relatives, you suppose? This, he said with intense scorn. How will it please their relatives to know that lies is wrote over them, and that everybody in the place knows that they be lies? He pointed to a stone at our feet, which had been laid down as a slab, on which the seat was rested close to the edge of the cliff. Read the lies on that thruff stone, he said. The letters were upside down to me where I sat, but Lucy was more opposite to them, so she leant over and read, Sacred to the memory of George Cannon, who died in the hope of a glorious resurrection, on July twenty ninth, eighteen seventy three, falling from the rocks at Kettleness. This tomb was erected by his sorrowing mother to her dearly beloved son. He was the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Really, Mr. Swales, I don't see anything very funny in that. She spoke her comment very gravely, and somewhat severely. You don't see aught funny, ha <laughs> ha! But that's because you don't gorm the sorrowing mother was a hell-cat that hated him, because he was a screwed, a regular lamentary was, and he hated her so that he committed suicide, in order that she mightn't get an insurance she put on his life. He blew nigh the top of his head off with an old musket that I had for scaring crows with. Twarn't for crows then, for it brought the clegs and the dopes to him. That's the way he fell off the rocks. And as to hopes of a glorious resurrection— I've often heard him say myself that he hoped he'd go to hell, for his mother was so pious that she'd be sure to go to heaven, and he didn't want to addle where she was. Now isn't that Steen at any rate? He hammered it with his stick as he spoke. A pack o' lies! And won't it make Gabriel keckle when Geordie comes panting out the grease with the top steam balanced on his hump, and asked to be took as evidence? I did not know what to say, but Lucy turned the conversation as she said, rising up, Oh, why did you tell us any of this? It is my favourite seat, and I cannot leave it, and now I find I must go on sitting over the grave of a suicide. That won't harm you, my pretty, and it may make poor Geordie gladsome to have so trim a lass sittin' on his lap. That won't hurt you. Why, I've sat here off and on for nigh twenty years past, and it hasn't done me no harm. Don't you fash about them as lies under you, or that doesn't lie there either. It'll be time for you to be getting scart when you see the tombsteens all run away with, and the place as bare as a stubble field. Ah, oh, there's the clock, and I must gang. My service to you, ladies. And off he hobbled. Lucy and I sat a while, 
and it was all so beautiful before us that we took hands as we sat, and she told me over all again about Arthur and their coming marriage. That made me just a little heartsick, for I haven't heard from Jonathan for a whole month. The same day. I came up here alone, for I am very sad. There was no letter for me. I hope there cannot be anything the matter with Jonathan. The clock has just struck nine. I see the lights scattered all over the town, sometimes in rows where the streets are, and sometimes singly. They run right up the esk and die away in the curve of the valley. To my left the view is cut off by a black line of roof of the old house next to the abbey. The sheep and lambs are bleating in the fields away behind me, and there is a clatter of donkey's hoofs up the paved road below. The band on the pier is playing a harsh waltz in good time, and farther along the quay there is a Salvation Army meeting in a back street. Neither of the bands hears the other, but up here I hear and see them both. I wonder where Jonathan is, and if he is thinking of me. I wish he were here. Dr. Seward's Diary 5 June The case of Renfield grows more interesting the more I get to understand the man. He has certain qualities very largely developed, selfishness, secrecy, and purpose. I wish I could get at what is the object of the latter. He seems to have some settled scheme of his own, but what it is I do not yet know. His redeeming quality is a love of animals, though indeed he has such curious turns in that, I sometimes imagine he is only abnormally cruel. His pets are of odd sorts. Just now his hobby is catching flies. He has at present such a quantity that I have had myself to expostulate. To my astonishment, he did not break out in a fury as I had expected, but took the matter in simple seriousness. He thought for a moment, and then said, May I have three days? I shall clear them away. Of course, I said that would do. I must watch him. 18 June. He has turned his mind now to spiders, and has got several very big fellows in a box. He keeps feeding them with his flies, and the number of the latter is becoming sensibly diminished, although he has used half his food in attracting more flies from outside to his room. 1 July. His spiders are now becoming as great a nuisance as his flies, and today I told him that he must get rid of them. He looked very sad at this, so I said that he must clear out some of them at all events. He cheerfully acquiesced in this, and I gave him the same time as before for reduction. He disgusted me much while with him, for when a horrid blowfly bloated with some carrion food buzzed into the room, he caught it, held it exultantly for a few moments between his finger and thumb, and before I knew what he was going to do, put it in his mouth and ate it. I scolded him for it, but he argued quietly that it was very good and very wholesome, that it was life, strong life, and gave life to him. This gave me an idea, or the rudiment of one. I must watch how he gets rid of his spiders. He has evidently some deep problem in his mind, for he keeps a little notebook in which he's always jotting down something. Whole pages of it are filled with masses of figures, generally single numbers added up in batches, and then the totals added up in batches again, as though he were focusing some account, as the auditors put it. 8 July. There is a method in his madness, and the rudimentary idea in my mind is growing. It will be a whole idea soon, and then, oh, unconscious cerebration, you will have to give the wall to your conscious brother. I kept away from my friend for a few days, so that I might notice if there were any changes. Things remain as they were, except that he has parted with some of his pets and got a new one. He has managed to get a sparrow, and has already partially tamed it. His means of taming is simple, for already the spiders have diminished. Those that do remain, however, are well fed, for he still brings in the flies by tempting them with his food. 19 July. We are progressing. My friend has now a whole colony of sparrows, and his flies and spiders are almost obliterated. When I came in, he ran to me and said he wanted to ask me a great favor, a very, very great favor, and as he spoke, he fawned on me like a dog. I asked him what it was, and he said, with a sort of rapture in his voice and bearing, a kitten, a nice little, sleek, playful kitten that I can play with 
and teach and feed and feed and feed. I was not unprepared for this request, for I had noticed how his pets went on increasing in size and vivacity, but I did not care that his pretty family of tame sparrows should be wiped out in the same manner as the flies and spiders. So I said I would see about it, and asked him if he would not rather have a cat than a kitten. His eagerness betrayed him as he answered, Oh yes, I would like a cat. I only asked for a kitten, lest you should refuse me a cat. No one would refuse me a kitten, would they? I shook my head and said that at present I feared it would not be possible, but that I would see about it. His face fell, and I could see a warning of danger in it, for there was a sudden fierce sidelong look which meant killing. The man is an undeveloped homicidal maniac. I shall test him with his present craving and see how it will work out. Then I shall know more. 10 p.m. I have visited him again and found him sitting in a corner brooding. When I came in, he threw himself on his knees before me and implored me to let him have a cat, that his salvation depended upon it. I was firm, however, and told him that he could not have it, whereupon he went without a word and sat down gnawing his fingers in the corner where I had found him. I shall see him in the morning early. 20 July Visited Renfield very early before the attendant went his rounds. Found him up and humming a tune. He was spreading out his sugar, which he had saved, in the window, and was manifestly beginning his fly-catching again, and beginning it cheerfully and with a good grace. I looked around for his birds, and not seeing them, asked him where they were. He replied, without turning around, that they had all flown away. There were a few feathers about the room, and on his pillow a drop of blood. I said nothing, but went and told the keeper to report to me if there were anything odd about him during the day. 11 a.m. The attendant has just been to me to say that Renfield has been very sick and has disgorged a whole lot of feathers. My belief is, doctor, he said, that he has eaten his birds, and that he just took and ate them raw. 11 p.m. I gave Renfield a strong opiate tonight, enough to make him sleep, and took away his pocketbook to look at it. The thought that has been buzzing about my brain lately is complete, and the theory is proved. My homicidal maniac is of a particular kind. I shall have to invent a new classification for him, and call him Zoophagus Life-Eating Maniac. What he desires is to absorb as many lives as he can, and has laid himself out to achieve it in a cumulative way. He gave many flies to one spider, and many spiders to one bird, and then wanted a cat to eat the many birds. What would have been his later steps? It would almost be worthwhile to complete the experiment. It might be done if there were only a significant cause. Oh, men sneered at vivisection, and yet look at its results today. Why not advance science in its most difficult and vital aspect, the knowledge of the brain? Had I even the secret of one such mind, did I hold the key to the fancy of even one lunatic, I might advance my own branch of science to a pitch compared with which Burden Sanders' physiology or Ferrier's brain knowledge would be as nothing. If only there were a sufficient cause. I must not think too much of this, or I may be tempted. A good cause might turn the scale with me, for may not I too be of an excellent brain congenitally? How well the man reasoned. Lunatics always do within their own scope. I wonder at how many lives he values a man, or if at only one. He has closed the account most accurately, and today begun a new record. How many of us begin a new record with each day of our lives? To me it seems only yesterday that my whole life ended with my new hope, and that truly I began a new record. So it will be until the great recorder sums me up and closes my ledger account with a balance to profit or loss. Oh, Lucy. Lucy, I cannot be angry with you, nor can I be angry with my friend whose happiness is yours. But I must only wait on hopeless and work. Work, work. If I only could have as strong a cause as my poor mad friend there, a good, unselfish cause to make me work. That would be indeed happiness. 
Mina Murray's Journal 26 July I am anxious, and it soothes me to express myself here. It is like whispering to oneself and listening at the same time. And there is also something about the shorthand symbols that makes it different from writing. I am unhappy about Lucy, and about Jonathan. I had not heard from Jonathan for some time, and was very concerned. But yesterday dear Mr. Hawkins, who is always so kind, sent me a letter from him. I had written asking him if he had heard, and he said the enclosed had just been received. It is only a line dated from Castle Dracula, and says that he is just starting for home. That is not like Jonathan. I do not understand it, and it makes me uneasy. Then, too, Lucy, although she is so well, has lately taken to her old habit of walking in her sleep. Her mother has spoken to me about it, and we have decided that I am to lock the door of our room every night. Mrs. Westenra has got an idea that sleepwalkers always go out on roofs of houses and along the edges of cliffs, and then get suddenly wakened or fall over with a despairing cry that echoes all over the place. Poor dear, she is naturally anxious about Lucy, and tells me that her husband, Lucy's father, had the same habit, and that he would get up in the night and dress himself and go out if he were not stopped. Lucy is to be married in the autumn, and she is already planning out her dresses and how her house is to be arranged. I sympathize with her, for I do the same. Only Jonathan and I will start in life in a very simple way, and shall have to try to make both ends meet. Mr. Holmwood, he is the Honourable Arthur Holmwood, only son of Lord Godalming, is coming up here very shortly, as soon as he can leave town, for his father is not very well, and I think dear Lucy is counting the moments till he comes. She wants to take him up to the seat in the churchyard cliff, and show him the beauty of Whitby. I dare say it is the waiting which disturbs her. She will be all right when he arrives. 27th July. No news from Jonathan. I am getting quite uneasy about him, though why I should I do not know. But I do wish that he would write, if it were only a single line. Lucy walks more than ever, and each night I am awakened by her moving about the room. Fortunately the weather is so hot that she cannot get cold. But still the anxiety and the perpetually being awakened is beginning to tell on me, and I am getting nervous and wakeful myself. Thank God Lucy's health keeps up. Mr. Holmwood has been suddenly called to ring to see his father, who has been taken seriously ill. Lucy frets at the postponement of seeing him, but it does not touch her looks. She is a trifle stouter, and her cheeks are a lovely rose pink. She has lost the anemic look which she had. I pray it will all last. 3rd August. Another week has gone by, and no news from Jonathan. Not even to Mr. Hawkins, from whom I have heard. How oh, I do hope he is not ill! He surely would have written. I look at that last letter of his, but somehow it does not satisfy me. It does not read like him. And yet it is his writing. There is no mistake of that. Lucy has not walked much in her sleep the last week, but there is an odd concentration about her which I do not understand. Even in her sleep she seems to be watching me. She tries the door, and finding it locked, goes about the room searching for the key. 6th August. Another three days, and no news. This suspense is getting dreadful. If I only knew where to write to, or where to go to, I should feel easier. But no one has heard a word of Jonathan since that last letter. I must only pray to God for patience. Lucy is more excitable than ever, but is otherwise well. Last week was very threatening, and the fishermen say that we are in for a storm. I must try to watch it and learn the weather signs. Today is a grey day, and the sun as I write is hidden in thick clouds, high over Kettleness. Everything is grey, except the green grass, which seems like emerald amongst it, grey earthy rock, grey clouds, tinged with the sunburst at the far edge, hang over the grey sea, into which the sand points stretch like grey figures. The sea is tumbling in over the shallows and the sandy flats with a roar, muffled in the sea mists drifting inland. The horizon is lost in a grey mist. All vastness, the clouds are piled up like giant rocks, and there is a brule over the sea that sounds like some passage of doom. Dark figures are on the beach here and there, sometimes half shrouded in the mist, and seem men like trees walking. 
the fishing boats are racing for home, and rise and dip in the ground swell as they sweep into the harbour, bending to the scuppers. Here comes old Mr. Swales. He is making straight for me, and I can see by the way he lifts his hat that he wants to talk. I have been quite touched by the change in the poor old man. When he sat down beside me, he said in a very gentle way, "'I want to say something to you, miss.' I could see he was not at his ease, so I took his poor old wrinkled hand in mine, and asked him to speak fully. So he said, leaving his hand in mine, "'I am afraid, my dearie, that I must have shocked you by all the wicked things I have been saying about the dead, and such like, for weeks past, but I didn't mean them, and I want you to remember that when I am gone. We are old folks that be daffled, and with one foot abaft the crook-hole, don't altogether like to think of it, and we don't want to feel scart of it, and that's why I've took to making light of it, so that I'd cheer up my own heart a bit. But, Lord love you, miss, I ain't afraid of dying, not a bit, only I don't want to die if I can help it. My time must be nigh at hand, no, for I be old, and a hundred years is too much for any man to expect, and I'm so nigh it that a yard man is already wet in his scythe. You see, I can't get out of the habit of caffin' about it all at once. The chaffs will wag as they be used to. Some day soon the angel of death will sound his trumpet for me. But don't ye do all and greet, me dearie? For he saw that I was crying. If he should come this very night, I'd not refuse to answer his call. For life be, after all, only a waitin' for something else than what we're doin', and death be all that we can rightly depend on. But I'm content, for it's comin' to me, my dearie, and comin' quick. It may be comin' while we be lookin' and wonderin'. Maybe it's in that wind out over the sea that's bringin' with it loss and wreck and sore distress and sad hearts. Look, look, he cried suddenly. There's something in that wind and in the house beyond that sounds and looks and tastes and smells like death. It's in the air. I feel it comin'. Lord, make me answer cheerful when my call comes. He held up his arms devoutly and raised his hat. His mouth moved as though he were praying. After a few minutes' silence, he got up, shook hands with me, and blessed me, and said good-bye, and hobbled off. It all touched me, and upset me very much. I was glad when the coast-guard came along, with his spy-glass under his arm. He stopped to talk with me, as he always does, but all the time kept looking at a strange ship. "'I can't make her out,' he said. "'She's a Russian, by the look of her. But she's knocking about in the queerest way— she doesn't know her mind a bit. She seems to see the storm coming, but can't decide whether to run up north in the open, or to put in here. Look there again. She is steered mighty strangely, for she doesn't mind the hand on the wheel, changes about with every puff of wind. We'll hear more of her before this time to-morrow. And there we must leave our story, with just a little bit of foreshadowing. Isn't Mr. Swales wonderful? Oh, I just love that guy. He's so much fun to listen to. And, you know, there are some pictures uh, of, allegedly, of uh, the original Mr. Swales, but I don't know if they're real or not. Just, you know, craggy, old, seafaring guy. Hmm. It's a lot of fun. And next week, we have more of the epistolary nature of this book with um, information coming in from various sources. So next week will be pretty interesting stuff. Once again, I want to thank everyone for your support and for your good wishes and for your kind words. I will be getting those bracelets out as soon as I can get to a post office. It's turned out to be quite difficult this week, but nonetheless, they will go. Thank you. Take care. Have a great week. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Please remember to support the people who support Craftlit. Visit Knit Circus online magazine, offering three rings of knitting, sewing, and fun. You can check out the latest issue at www.knitcircus.com. And what would Madame Defarge knit? A new book of knit and crochet patterns coming to you from the Craftlit family. And please visit the blogs and sites of Craftlit supporters. Those links can be found in the sidebar of the show notes. The show notes can be found at craftlit.com. Craftlit can also be accessed by its own Android and iPhone application. You can purchase it at 
the iPhone or iTouch application store, or you can subscribe free at iTunes. Craftlit is made possible by the generous support of its listeners, and for that, I am truly grateful. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one.